We've come to 1 John chapter 4. And uh, we're finally getting to the place where we have to sort things out and make sure we get through to the end. And tonight I would say we're going to have two sermons. Um, the brief passage at the beginning of chapter 4. And then we're going to do something that I don't like to do. And stop in the middle of a development of thought that runs from chapter 4 verse 7 on into the first part of chapter 5. We won't be able to cover all of that, but uh, try to get to the place we need to be in order in another couple of lessons to complete First John. In the first part of this, verses 1 through 6, there's a passage about testing the spirits, how to tell the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. There's a larger connection of thought that I want to call attention to here, and then a more immediate connection of thought. Chapter 4 is related to chapter 3, verse 23, I think. This is not something I thought of, but one good scholar suggested this. This is the commandment, verse 3.23 says, this is the commandment that we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another, even as he gave us commandment. Well, the first part of chapter 4 relates to the first element in this commandment, the believing in the name of his son Jesus Christ. The first six verses will deal with that. And then the other aspect is developed in chapter 4, verses uh, 7 through 21. In fact, uh, I probably should have said on into chapter 5 a couple of verses because I really believe there's not much of a division of thought between chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. Now there's a more immediate connection of chapter 4 1 through 6, with the very end of chapter 3, the, the 24th verse and uh, the second half of it, where he says, And in this we know that he abide, abideth in us. Now that's referring backwards. Um, sometimes you have these in this or hereby we know something and then it'll the the rest of the sentence or maybe the next verse or two will develop that thought if you don't have something like that then you probably need to look backwards to find what he's talking about and in this case I think you probably have to look backwards in this we know that he abides in us uh, the, the love of the brethren the keeping of the commandments which teaches about how we relate to each other in this we know that he abides in us and we know it literally from the spirit which he gave us. So first the certainty that the one who loves his brother or which is the same thing who keeps the commandments is in fellowship with God. And then the source of the certainty that we have. We know it from the spirit he gave us. He taught us. He revealed this. We were taught by him. And then chapter 4 begins with a word of caution. That we need to be certain that the spirit we listen to is the one God gave us because there are others that people listen to. So look at that. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but prove the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. You're sort of looking for him to say many false spirits are going out into the world, but he doesn't say that, does he? He says many false prophets. This is the way the spirit was given to us by... Uh, these men who were spokesmen for God prophets who spoke by divine revelation were placed in the churches and so any church that had 
a prophet or a spokesman from God in it had the Word of God. They didn't have the New Testament yet. Now the, the, uh, they, they had the Spirit present in a man. Now it's present in the written Word. And John has pointed this out from the beginning when he says we declare these things about Christ to you and uh, now we write these things to you. So the oral declaration made it possible for people to be in fellowship with God but now it's put in writing so that through the written word we can enter into this fellowship with God. It was in Men, now it's in the Word, the written Word, the documents. <clears throat> Beloved, the address shows John is addressing his spiritual children according to verse 4 of the text a little later. He cares deeply for them. He does not want them to be deceived. He does not want to be, them to be led astray by the liars as he calls these false teachers back in chapter 2 verse 22 and deceivers who have arisen with teaching that is other than that which had been received from the apostolic witnesses in the beginning I'm referring partly here to this development in uh, the ending of chapter 2 this goes back to chapter 2 verse 24 the teaching that they'd gotten from the witnesses from the beginning. The certainty about the relationship with God derives from the spirit God gave us. Chapter 3, 24 says, but not every spirit can be believed. So prove the spirits whether they are from God. Well, the reason is because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Not false spirits, but false prophets. So the plural, spirits, prove the spirits, refers to manifestations of a spirit through the prophets. It's helpful to notice the way Paul uses similar language in 1 Corinthians 14 when... Uh, he says, I think it's verse 12, he says, you are zealous of spiritual gifts is the way it will usually be translated. But the original says you are zealous of spirits. And it's clear that it's referring to spiritual gifts. The whole context will show that, these different manifestations of the spirit. You're zealous of spirits, plural, when it's referring to various manifestations of the Spirit. Later on, in verse 32, when he's given the order, the orderly way in which the church was to proceed, he ends up by saying the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. And again, I think the plural refers to the spirit, the gift that the prophet does, the various manifestations of the spirit and in verse 32 there specifically the spirits of the prophets they're subject to the prophets you know if somebody says well, I just can't help myself I'm, it's the Holy Spirit no it's not the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets and so you can be obedient to what he says about the order and being silent when you need to be silent and taking turns and all the rest of that. The word prove is to put a thing to the test in order to determine whether it's genuine or not. In the Greek Old Testament and in the New Testament in some passages as well. There are comparisons to the testing of precious metals. There are various devices that are used in the printing of money today. We're testing it to determine whether it's genuine or counterfeit. I notice if I uh, give the 7-Eleven or whoever it is a $20 bill, they look more closely at it and they want to check it off. At least they do this in Florida. I don't know what they're looking at. 
but there's something there they're seeing that uh, makes them know this is real and not counterfeit. How can the spirits be put to the test and proved? Well, the test that's to be applied is what they say about Jesus. In verses 2 and 3 we see that. In this know ye, the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not Jesus is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof you've heard that it cometh, and now it is in the world already. So uh, he had spoken of Antichrist, or singular, which was expected. And now, again, he says, excuse me, that this is fulfilled in the appearance of these various different, uh, multiple Antichrist people prophets, spokesmen that are against Christ. So the test is not what they claim. It doesn't make any difference how certain they seem when they claim that God has spoken to them. It's not how they feel. It's a test that is based on their teaching and specifically what a prophet says about Jesus. In verse 2, there's a way to recognize the Spirit of God or the Spirit that is from God. In this know you. Know you. Taking the verb as imperative rather than just a statement you know. Every spirit that confesseth Jesus Christ having come in the flesh. It's a perfect tense that's used there. Having come in the flesh and thus uh, now his coming is manifested. That spirit is from God. I'm guessing that this is a test that was conclusive in the specific situation that John deals with. The assumption is that the prophet says what he really believes. He says what he really believes about Christ or denies. And he does not take into complication, uh, consideration the complication that is dealt with in Matthew chapter 7 when there were people who would claim things that were not so. They were pretending, but it was not the claim to do many mighty works, all these things. That's the passage I'm talking about. But these people evidently really did believe what they were saying about Jesus. And so the way to recognize the spirit that is from God, verse 2, and then the recognition of false prophets in verse 3. The spirit of the Antichrist clearly is, the singular is used collectively. It's not a single individual, but it's fulfilled in the appearance of a plurality of Antichrist, the many false prophets that had gone out into the world. They'd had advanced knowledge of these things, the coming of such men, and now they're already in the world. You go back to chapter 2 verse 18 and you have the same thing said. The substance of the confession in chapter 4, 2, and 3, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. I'm guessing must have had special reference to positions that were taken by John's opponents. In uh, chapter 5 and verse 6, he said this is the one that came by water and the blood. Not the water only, but by the water and the blood. Now doesn't that tell you that somebody was saying he came by the water but not by the blood? And John wants it to be very clear that this one who died on the cross, the one who shed his blood, was the Son of God. This sounds like views that were taken by a man named Corinthus. Now I don't know whether John dealt directly with him or whether there were others who took similar views that the deity or the Christhood um, came upon Jesus at his baptism. 
Well, I think you can see the plausible argument that they make, make from that with the Holy Spirit coming upon him at that point. And then they would say that it left him before he died on the cross. And you can see a plausible element that they may appeal to to prove something like that. He says, why, why hast thou forsaken me? So they would say, in effect, that it was not really the Christ who died on the cross. And so the correct confession is an acknowledgement that in Jesus, deity had been incarnated and, in fact, that it was the Son of God who died on the cross. If you don't believe that, then the cross doesn't have the meaning. It's not the manifestation of love that John says it is. And since we love because he first loved us, then the basis for our loving each other is gone. All of this is just tied up together. In verse 4, he speaks of the victory that his readers had over the Antichrist. I want you to notice the difference in the pronouns here. There's ye, there's they, and there's we. A distinction with these three different groups. Ye are of God. My little children, these are the people he's writing to. And you have overcome them, these teachers, because greater is he than in, that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore speak they as of the world, and the world heareth them. And now the third, we are of God. Ye, they, we. And this is distinguished from both they and ye. It's not we Christians. It's a distinct group other than that. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He listens to us. He pays attention. He who is not of God heareth us not. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So... The contrast, and these pronouns are emphatic. In other words, the pronouns actually written in the original, not just implied in the verb. So it's the different pronouns, you, in contrast with the others, and they, and we. But the, again, the, the preposition, when he says you are of God, is literally from God. It indicates the source or the der derivation. You have overcome them. False prophets had risen. They had asserted their position. They had made their arguments. But John's little children had fought this spiritual battle and one. And the explanation of that victory is because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The reference is to God and perhaps God in Christ. There's not a lot of distinction when you uh, look all through this epistle. He's referring to God as manifested in Christ. And he's greater than the one that is in them. It's a reference to the greatness of God. I think again it's talking about his superiority in, in the way of knowledge. You had that back in uh, chapter 3 and verse 20. Um, you can persuade, we can persuade our heart before him because if our heart, or that I think is better, that if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Again, an appeal to the greatness of God and is a, great, a greatness in knowledge. So it's a superior knowledge that is probably to the point here just as it was in chapter 3 verse 20 
the opponents were the false prophets with the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of truth was not in them. They were liars. They were deceivers. They were ignorant of the truth. But John's readers had the spirit of truth. They knew the truth. They had won the conflict by means of the power of the truth. I think it'll be worthwhile to go back to, uh, I believe it's 220. You have an anointing from the Holy One. And you all know, you all have knowledge. I've not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. But I think the thing I was really thinking about was uh, the reference to the young men back in chapter 2, verse uh, 14, when he says, I've written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the evil one. Notice how much of that language is repeated over here. So it, the, the greatness of the one who was in them was a greatness in knowledge and in them by the medium of the word of God or the, uh, the revelation of God. And they had fought this battle and they'd won by means of the power of the truth. So the, the source of the strength was the word of God which was in them from which they derived power to fight the battle and to win. This is the way we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Um, we know some things because of the spirit or from, we know it from the spirit he gave us but make sure the spirit you're listening to is the one God gave and here's the way you tell the difference. So this is an important passage. I hardly ever study with people like Pentecostals and various ones that I'm not turning to this passage to say here's how you know. It's not the claims. It's not how you feel. It's what they say. What do they say? I want to know what they say and I don't care how much they talk about God talking to them. If they're saying the wrong thing about Jesus, they're liars. That's it pure and simple. They're not telling the truth and we just let that settle it on the basis that John gave us the test here. This final summary here is uh, with regard to the spirit of truth and the spirit of error and how to distinguish one from another. Bishop Spunk, Spunk, I think it is, said you've got to, you've got to re, re, reconsider Christianity. We've got to look at it in the light of the new knowledge that we have of the world. And so in every age, Christianity becomes a different thing. Well, this shepherd of the flock was a wolf. And John takes a very different view when he says, if you want to know and distinguish the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, you've got to go back from the beginning. And who is it that is listening to the witnesses? I don't care how many degrees the man had or whether he fooled a whole big church into appointing him as a shepherd of the flock. The man was just a deceiver and an antichrist and just a plain liar. Now I'm not, this is not me, I'm just using language that John uses for somebody like him. So, you can follow him if you want to, but I'm going to test it in the light of what John says. Now, in the next main section, this is the place where we're going to have to get just part way through and, uh, stop in the middle of it somewhere. I'll try to be at the end of one of the subdivisions anyway. He takes and develops the second part of the commandment back in, in 323, the, the love of the brethren, the love of the brothers. And he 
puts the combination of the love of the brothers and the confession of Christ together. And the combination is brought into relation as manifesting the relationship to God. I think that's a good summary of what we've got from 4.7 through 5.4. So this book has this spiral development. It keeps uh, embracing a little more and a little more and then finally they're all intertwined and you see that they're all related to each other. The belief in the name that was spoken of in chapter 3 verse 23 was discussed in this passage we just looked at, chapter 4 verses 1 through 6. And now he returns to earlier passages about love of the brothers. And these two topics are shown to be interrelated. And so intertwined is not to be separated. You're not going to be able to love the brethren if you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and confess Him. That's the thing that enables us to have this kind of love. And then this discussion is going to continue all the way into chapter 5 and about verse 4. Now I want you to notice something about the, uh, the break points in this long passage, the subheads. He starts in with something that he comes back to, rounding it out at the end of the subdivision. You have that at least more than once. I don't know that I can prove this on with regard to every subhead. But he returns in chapter 4 verse 7 to the thought of the commandment in the form of an exhortation. Let us love one another. Beloved, let us love one another. And the reason is given. The word for there means because. Love is of God. That's the first reason. It derives from God. Who is the origin of it? The source of it. And furthermore, a person's relationship with God is manifested by love. And so he says, and everyone that loveth is begotten of God and knows God. Love is from God. And then the converse is also true in verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. It's of the nature and essence of God that he is loved. But I don't think you can reverse these terms. You can't say love is God. It says God is love. But you cannot say love is God. You can't conjure up some definition of love as is often done. I mean, there's every kind of a perversity today that parades under the name of love. But you can't just concoct some definition of love and decide that that's what God is like. You can't start with love. You have to start with God. The character of God defines love and it's not the other way around. Somebody's idea of love does not define what God is but God and his actions define what love is. Look at him. Look at the manifestation on the cross. And in verses 9 and 10 love is defined historically by the manifestation of God in Christ. Herein, or in this, was the love of God manifested in us, or in our case, as it may be, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we love God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the propitiatory sacrifice. And we discussed that back at the beginning of, of chapter 2. So in this, in both of the in this, these are the hereby's that you have in verses 9 and 10. You've got the what he's talking about explained by prepositional phrases following. If you don't have this kind of a declining or defining phrase or clause, then the reference has to be sought in what precedes. And often that's the case. Back in chapter 3, verse 19 it is. It's manifested in us or in our case. The love of God is. So the cross is the proof of God's essential character. Can anybody doubt it? That God is love when you look at the cross? And again, love is not defined by some act of man, but by the act of God. We cannot look at love as it is practiced among men and conclude that we know something about God. We have to look first to God to learn about love as it ought to be practiced among men. Now in verse 11 we see that this manifestation of love at the cross that it brings us under obligation. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So you see he's back to the way he started in verse 7 and this is what I mean about he asserts something and then develops the thought and then comes back and concludes at the end. He's proved his point. So then we go from that to verses 12 through 16 which deals with the certainty with regard to this relationship with God that the person has who loves the brethren the certainty of it that comes through revelation of the Spirit. This is what he had said at the end of chapter 3. We know this from the Spirit he gave us. Now he's going to develop this whole thing here and it's a little bit complicated but we're going to see what we can do with this. In verse 12 no man hath beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. When we love each other, we've got the character of God in us. And he said we're God-like. We... Uh, show the relationship with God as he, we, we discussed this earlier in, in chapter 3. Nobody has seen God, beheld God at any time. That's what John had said in the gospel. No man hath seen God at any time. The, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. John 1.18 Again, as at the beginning of this whole passage, John begins with a, a second assertion about God. No one has beheld God, but if we love each other, we have God in us. He remains in us. And so his love is manifested in us when we love one another. His character is manifested in us. I don't know what people are thinking of when they think that God in some personal, immediate sense dwells in us. It would sear us, I imagine, if that were the case. But we have his character in us. And then he says that his love is perfected in us. That love, which is of the essence of his character, which was manifested at the cross, 
verses 9 and 10, attains its end or its goal when we practice that love toward each other. Remember 3, 16 through 18. Here, here's what love is. It's manifested in the cross. We ought, to, uh, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. If we won't even share our likely, livelihood, then there's no way you can claim that that love of God is in such a person as that. But the idea of the being perfected in us is the idea that it reaches its end in us. Teleao is the verb. It reaches its telos, its end, its object or its goal in us when we love each other. When, when that love that sent Jesus down the cross, when that is reproduced in us, then God's love has attained its end or its goal in us. And now, verse 13, in this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he hath given us, and again, its source from his spirit. He's given us from his spirit. Not he's given us his spirit, he's given us from his spirit. He's given us something that comes from his spirit. What is it? Well, you had the same back, thought back in chapter uh, 324. Uh, we, we know that he abides in us from the spirit which he gave us and we see from that context that it's the knowledge that's what it is that we have from the spirit the knowledge the revelation that comes from the spirit he has given us from his spirit well what is the context that defines that knowledge from his spirit back in chapter 3 same thing here, and I want you to notice some detail. Verse 14 speaks of the role of the witnesses. And we, which is emphatic again, and we have beheld and bear witness that the Father hath sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. We, emphatic, we have beheld, we bear witness, we know, and so we bear witness. That's not talking about we Christians, but emphatically the we that this whole epistle started with, the witnesses. We're not witnesses. We didn't behold and bear witnesses or bear witness but the apostles did they did and so they understood the cross they were able to bear witness we, they beheld and they bear witness that the father has sent the son as the savior of the world we know about the relationship because he's given us from his spirit and he did that through witnesses who beheld and who give their testimony that the father hath sent the son to be the savior of the world we can cite the testimony of the apostles but we're not the witnesses to it there were two things actually that were necessary in order to be witnesses and one was that they had to experience the events. Their eyes saw, their ears heard, their hands handled concerning the word of life. But then, you know, they could say what they saw, but they were not going to know the meaning of it without the revelation from the Spirit. That's why he didn't want them to go speaking before the Holy Spirit came. 
that was necessary in order to understand the meaning of the cross. They could tell what they saw, but they couldn't explain the meaning of it without the revelation of the Spirit. So, the testimony of the Spirit and that of the apostles is combined in this passage, chapter 4, 13, 14, in the way that it was in John, the Gospel, chapter 15, 26 and 27, against the world that would hate Jesus and bear false witness against him and all that. He says, but the Spirit, when he's come, he'll bear witness of me. He will vindicate me. He'll speak on my behalf. And you also bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. That's not you and it's not me. But it was people who had been with him from the beginning of his personal ministry. And they were witnesses, not in some pretended sense, but in reality. And so he completes the explanation here of how we know that God is in us when we love each other. We know that from the Spirit, through the witnesses, the apostles. And so he completes the explanation here. All right. Um, now, in verse 15, he speaks of who has the fellowship with God that is spoken of in verse 13. Well, the we in verse 14 is emphatic. And it's talking about we witnesses, we, uh, we apostles. But in verse 15, whosoever, this is not just some special group, but whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Anyone can have this fellowship with God that was possessed but first by the apostles through the revelation made to him whosoever shall confess that Jesus was what he claimed to be confession is an expression of belief and it's based on the testimony of the witnesses that's what Romans 10 17 is saying and what it means so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God I guess I used to think that was sort of double talk, that he was saying the same thing twice. But it really, there's a distinction between those two points he makes. The hearing is not the act of hearing, but the same word is used when it speaks of the report that went forth. The thing heard, the message. Faith comes of the thing heard. And where'd that come from? It came from revelation of God. It came from the Word of God or the revelation of God. And so, based on that testimony, we believe and we confess who Jesus is. And so, these are the ones which includes us and anybody who will make this confession. He has the fellowship with God that was spoken of in... Uh, Verse 13. The same assurance is given here to confessors as was given to those who love the fellow Christians back in chapter 12 and 13. They're not, in fact, different. You can't do the loving without being able to confess who he was that died on the cross. And so... The 16th verse assumes this connectedness. And we know and have believed the love which God hath in us. God is love. 
And he that abideth in love abideth in God, and God abideth in him. We is emphatic here in verse 16. Whoever shall confess Jesus is in the right relationship with God. Not everyone does, and in fact, we have. And so, we understand what happened at the cross on the basis of that revelation. We know and have believed the love which God hath in us. We understand the essence of God. They're non-confessors who don't understand, but we, emphatically, we have experienced this. And he that abideth in love abideth in God, and God abides in him. This, he speaks of the love which God hath in us. Well, the love that was manifested at the cross was for everybody, available. He's a propitiation for the sins of the whole world. So the manifestation of love was in fact for the whole world, but only those who acknowledge the identity of Jesus can understand what happened at the cross. So just as in the first section from 7 through 11 he starts out with an assertion and develops it and rounds it out by coming back to the way he started, he does in this second section, verses 12 to 16, which is rounded out and concluded by a return to the beginning. God is love. And we understand that love. We understand what happened at the cross because we, we are the confessors who confess on the basis of the testimony that the witnesses have given. We have believed the love, the love, not some undefined, perhaps undefinable abstraction, but that particular love that was defined by the character of God and that was manifested by the sacrifice of the Son of God on the cross. Love as thus defined, is to be practiced toward our brothers. We are to love as Christ loved. We are to walk as he walked. All of this from earlier passages. The love of God manifested at the cross is the love that is to be practiced among disciples of Jesus. And so the love of God will be in us. With all this material behind us, the last part of verse 16 does not come in as a surprise. He that abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. That's where we're going to have to start and I think we'll be alright to start with verse 17 next time where he talks about love being made perfect, reaching its end in us. And I want you to, uh, if you get a chance to read very carefully and perhaps read the book on this su subject and be uh, prepared for some de detailed discussion on this. He's not talking about a time when our love will just be flawless. It's God's love that's perfected in us that throws the fear out. That's what enables us to face the end and the judgment without any fear. Not that we are wonderful, but what God has done and that his love has been perfected in us. We'll begin at that point next time. Appreciate the good attention. And
This is a way people can be saved. They, they, John teaches us about becoming sons of God and he started that third chapter by saying, Look, behold, that marvelous love that God manifested in order to make it possible for us to be children of God. And we really are. Not just a pretense or just an imagined thing. You can be a son of God. Marvel of marvel at the love that made that possible. Why would anybody want to resist when he could be so much? If there's anyone who needs to do the things the Bible teaches us in order to become a son of God, then we want to give the opportunity. If you've studied, you know what you need to do, then you need to come forward and do it. Why not? And uh, if you don't know, then there are plenty of people here that are willing to sit down with you and open the book and show you. And then you can become a son of God. Wonderful thing. If you need to come tonight, why not as we stand and sing?